So he was sitting with Byron. He goes, let me introduce you to this young man. And I looked around and I said, uh, you know, uh, this kid here did really well. And I said, Dad, he's over 65 years old. <laughs> Dad said, oh, he'll always be a kid to me and he's always done great things. So, and then, and, uh, Anyway, 50 years ago, I could say my dad built his outhouse. So that's my introduction to By uh, Byron. He's done a lot of great things, and I'm really proud to uh, be here with him. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. Sydney was in Yakutat building outhouses for the Indian Health Service. And they were beautiful outhouses. They were white with red trim. <laughs> Fortunately, at about the same time the next year, IHS was there also installing the first real sewer and water system. And so some of the outhouses were never used, and they became wonderful smokehouses. And I, I, I think there may still be some in town. I had three things that I wanted to talk about. I remember two of them. So as we move along, maybe the third will pop into my mind. I'd like to begin by thanking ANVCA for this opportunity. Uh, I'm sorry, Maver isn't here. Uh, I'd like to speak just for a moment about a real vision, a real example of who we are and the very best amongst us, at least in terms of exemplifying who we can be today. Anna Hoffman as you all know, uh, is the CEO of a large village corporation. Uh, she's a Stanford graduate. But she also still lives at home and dedicates her life to her family and her community there, as well as to making Alaska a better place for us all. She's a fluent Yupik speaker and she understands her history and her culture and what makes Native peoples who they are. I know there are other examples, but there aren't a whole lot. And I know also that in most every corporation, village and regional, that we work hard to create new leaders in the mold of those like Anna. And even if we're not able to speak our own languages, hopefully through her example and again that of others like her and those who came before in the previous generation of leadership, we have examples and we have those that we can point to in terms of our own aspirations as Native leaders. I happen to serve on the board of a quite large corporation and several months ago our board met in Honolulu. And it was the first time that our board had met there, although the company has done business in Hawaii for a number of years. And the company's purpose in meeting in Hawaii as a board was to understand Hawaii, to get a sense of the business climate, to get a sense of, of, the, of the social and economic and, and governmental leadership. And the company asked that, if possible, a three-member panel be set up to speak to 
our board about Hawaii. What is Hawaii? What are what makes Hawaii what it is? What makes it a good place to do business? And as you might imagine, there was an economic guru, a gentleman named Walter Dodds, who I would characterize or uh, uh, compare to Elmer Rasmussen, the founder and, and now gone CEO of the National Bank of Alaska who was viewed as the economic, uh, uh, epitomized example of Alaska's economy, both in the past and into the present. There was an individual from the Hawaiian tourism industry who was the head of the Hawaiian Tourism Bureau. I would compare that individual to one of the big oil companies sending their key representative to speak in Alaska because tourism is their major business. And the third person was a native Hawaiian, a cultural spokesperson, a cultural representative. And it was interesting to me that in their presentation, all three spoke to Hawaiian values, to Hawaiian vision, to Hawaiian aspiration. The person who spoke about Hawaii's economy several times referred to the cultural presenter. The tourism leader spoke to how hugely important the native Hawaiian community and values and vision for their own future was to all of Hawaii. The cultural presenter spoke to what made Hawaii what it is from the perspective and from the vision of Native Hawaiians. We all know that Native Hawaiians are recognized in the Hawaiian Constitution. We all know that much of the, of the spirit of aloha place names, recognition of heroes in Hawaii is replete with the history and the beauty of Native Hawaiians. That night at our corporate dinner, the governor of Hawaii was present. The dinner did not begin until a native Hawaiian chanter had chanted a beautiful opening prayer, or pule. When the governor got up to spoke, the governor began by saying, I welcome you to Hawaii, but I also want to begin by thanking the First Peoples of Hawaii, the native Hawaiian people who have enriched in so many ways all of our lives. Now Hawaii is not a perfect place. No place is. And there are issues between and amongst Native Hawaiians and the larger population. But there is this powerful and palpable recognition and visible and articulated sense of the place and the value of Native Hawaiians to Hawaiian society. And as I was experiencing that day, 
I couldn't help but compare it to our state, Alaska. The fact that Native Alaskans are not recognized in any way in the Alaska Constitution. The fact that major public policy aspirations of Alaska's Native peoples are in large part not shared by the governmental direction and even ideology of our state. That tribes, the very essence of our organization and our traditions and bearers of much of our culture are not recognized in the public policy of the state of Alaska. That while our involvement in the state has grown and changed over the years in a much more positive way than was the case, say, when I began in the early 1960s. It is still not, in my judgment, where it needs to be. There is not an implicit recognition of the place and the value and the beauty and the vision of Alaska's Native peoples and Alaska's society. That is very specifically expressed in the conduct of our government. We are making progress for sure, but I pine for the day when our governor would never be expected to begin an address of importance to any group in Alaska without thanking and recognizing the place and purpose and beauty and contribution of Alaska's First Peoples. That any corporation, any significant institution on its introduction to Alaska would never be expected to come to our home and our place and seek to do business in our homelands without being greeted and without making an effort to understand the first peoples of Alaska. We have a way to go. We have a way to go. I think there is goodwill in our state. I think that the strides we have made are very considerable. I'm not attempting to be negative or to point fingers. I'm stating a reality as at least I see it. And when I am asked questions about this belief, this kind of personal vision of the kind of Alaska we should have, This is usually what I say. If we were 50 years from now in the second 50 years of Alaska's existence as a state, celebrating our centennial, and the rest of the world were looking on, which it will be, Alaska is a unique place. When Alaska celebrates its 100th anniversary, it will be a significant event. And if at that centennial, Alaska Natives are not mentioned, Alaska Natives are not celebrated, Alaska Natives are not recognized for the beauty and the value system and the fact that Alaska is their home, Alaska will be a far lesser place, a very, very far lesser place. There is no other place in our union where Native people still live on their homelands, original homelands, except for very, very few and very, very minor instances.
Sometimes people say to me, just get over it, Malat. What does that stuff matter? To me, it vibrates and resonates in every aspect of my existence and in every sense of my being. And I think not just of this generation or of the children and their children yet to come of Alaska's Native peoples. I think of my mother, whom I spoke of last year when I was here. And I think of my grandmother, and I think of my uncles, and I think of clan and tribal and community members that I never had the opportunity to meet other than to visit their gravestones. And think about the kind of world they would have wanted for their children. Was it to be totally assimilated? To have as the aspiration of a total society to have in a hundred years after statehood almost a hundred years after the passage of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act and the retention of at least a small portion of our homelands Would it be their vision to have us gone? We know what the answer to that is, absolutely not. I emphasize it because as I was listening yesterday to Willie Hensley and his daughter Lizzie speak, when those of us of that era, the early, however you articulate it, those of us who were around and involved with ANCSA when it was created. <clears throat> very few of us talk about business, do we? Willie very rarely talks about business. He teaches business. He's an astute business person in his own right. I serve on many, many corporate boards. I'm a director of a multi-billion dollar corporation, have been for 30 years. I don't talk about that stuff. To me, my existence as a native person in the state of Alaska, wanting it to be ultimately a native place. Not a native place that excludes others, but a native place that includes every Alaskan in a way that the beauty in every single one of our respective cultures are celebrated and respected. I don't want us to be measured by the success of our corporations financially. The other way I look at our world is what will make ANCSA a success? It is my very firm belief that if at that 100 year anniversary, ANCSA Corporation still exists, <clears throat> and they may very well be key as they are today and even greater elements of the Alaska economic society at that time. But if native peoples are nowhere to be seen, and when I say seen, I mean celebrated and recognized and respected, living on their own homelands with a, a societal sense and knowledge that they are there and that they are important to our very existence. If that is not there, in my judgment, ANCSA will have been a failure. Because when Willie and myself and others were involved, it was not about economics. It was not about a financial future. It was about preserving the land for future generations. And all that that means deep in our souls. Enough of that. It's a belief and a value and a sense of what Alaska culture can be. That at that hundred year anniversary, the world would look at a place and say, they got it right. They got it right. They have a value proposition. They have a vision and had a vision of their future. 
that allows us as a total society, not just in the US, but hopefully the world, to help shape our own. Because right now, we are collectively going in a very different direction. So, the other thing I wanted to talk about is ANBCA itself. I applaud its creation. I applaud its leadership. It was very, very long overdue when it was created. And I look forward to a hugely successful future. But there's an element of ANGSA itself that I also want to talk about. 7i, 7j, the idea of sharing, totally antithetical to anything we know about the business world. What if Alaska Airlines had to share 70% of its profits with every other airline? It'd be like Siri saying, damn it, we could give you all the 7i, we get nothing back. <laughs> At least for a while it was that way. Now it's somebody else, is it Nana or, or who else? Uh, <clears throat> but we live with that reality and it was consciously done because we are in essence a communal people. And think about it in the world context again. Alaska is really another country. It's huge, it's diverse. Its peoples are hugely different one from the other, ethnically and racially and in terms of our languages. And even today as Alaska overall has grown, Anchorage has become one of the most diverse in ethnicity in America. We must capture the values, the sense of purpose, the aspirations of every individual in our society, but we must not forget those cultures that have very strong values built upon sharing and communal life. ANCSA corporations, the regional corporations in early years, some of you may not know this, others do. We took some of our own resources and helped several other corporations through very hard times. One corporation was on the verge of bankruptcy and we diverted 7i earnings to that corporation in order to give it the opportunity to grow again. The makeup of ANBCA today has among the most successful, the brightest, the most forward-looking of ANGSA village corporations. But I commend to your attention those that aren't in the room, those that aren't so successful, those that are struggling, those that may have been dormant for some period of time. I commend to your attention that AMBCA will be an institution recognized for its contribution and its living of native values if it were to become an incubator of opportunity for all village corporations if it were to look at the full range of village corporations and put its hand out and say, what can we do to make us all better? Because when, and there will be a when, Alaska's native village corporations collectively become very significant contributors to the Alaskan economy that will add another dimension that is not yet significantly tapped to the native presence, to the native value, to the native contribution to growing this incredibly beautiful and wonderful place. But more importantly, 
it will allow an institution owned by, given opportunity by, given life to by its own people. So I just believe deeply that that is very much in your minds. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I just put that out there for all of us to think about. I'm also a village corporation director. There was a third thing, but damned if I can think of it. You're probably getting tired of my speaking anyway. So I'm going to close there. Um, you know, we as Native people, we're in both a wonderful place, but we're also in a very difficult place. As has often been said, we have to live in both worlds. We celebrate ourselves. We need for others to celebrate us also. We look forward to the future of our children as native people with communal values, with a sense of where they come from and who their ancestors were and the traditions and the beauty that made their ancestors right up to the time of their parents who they are, but yet they must live in an incredibly fast-moving and changing world of their peers who are non-native. And the friends they make and the relationships they build and the life they build for themselves must be as rich and wonderful in that larger world as it is in their own. Huge task. But as I look back on almost 50 years now of both personal involvement and what we've done with not just ANCSA, but with the re-emergence of tribes as significant institutions, with the growth of, of institutions that are responsive to virtually every aspect of our lives, to be able to look out on a crowd like this and see doctors and lawyers and MBAs and CFOs and, you know, I'll tell you how bad it was when we started. Willie was the only one with a college degree and we barely trusted him. <laughs> no, I have to say this, in listening with Willie, to Willie and, and his daughter Liz yesterday, for me it just brought back a lot of memories. And one of those memories was, as has been mentioned, and appropriately so, so many times, that there was a key leadership cadre during those days, just as there are today. And one of those very key leaders was Willie Hensley, a man with a vision, a man able to articulate that vision a man able to understand the essence of what we were up against and what we had to achieve. And when I hear him speak, I stop and I listen. And I hope we all did that yesterday as well. And to see his daughter shut him up. <laughs> you know, wasn't that cool? <laughs> Who's also an emerging leader, as I see so many in this room. So thank you so much. It's been real great being here. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few words with you. <laughs>